So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ira. I'm the manager of the Democracy and Governance Unit at IDEAS. And today you are joining us in our third webinar in our IDEAS series of COVID-19 webinars. Uh, this one's called COVID-19 Stimulus Package Delivering with Democracy. Um, we have done two other webinars before this. Uh, one, the first one was on the economic uh, mitigating the economic impact of COVID-19 and the second one was on um, food security uh, and how uh, do we manage that uh, in these challenging times. Um, so for this webinar, we are focusing on the democratic accountability perspective of the government stimulus package, uh, a topic that's easily overlooked but uh, equally uh, important in these challenging times. And uh, to speak more about this topic, we have uh, three great panelists uh, who have uh, very kindly agreed to join us this morning. Uh, Lim Wei Jiet, a constitutional lawyer, uh, Trisha Yeo, a fellow at IDEAS, and also YB Wong Chen, who's the member of parliament for Subang. Um, for the attendees, if you have any questions for our panelists, please do type them into the uh, Q&A uh, section at the bottom of your screen. Um, and the panelists can either uh, type in their answers to, uh, for you or they can also uh, speak about it during their, during, their sec during their session. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite Lim Wei Jet uh, to begin with his presentation. Uh, he will be giving us an overview of the constitutional framework um, of the stimulus package. So over to you, Wei Jet. Thank you, Ara. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing fine. I will speak mainly on two issues. Uh, number one is the constitutional framework when it comes to passing economic stimulus packages, and also the value of parliamentary debates uh, to improve any stimulus packages using experiences across the globe, like the US and Singapore, for example. I'm going to share some slides now. It's See whether this works. Right, so uh, at its most basic, uh, Article 104, the Constitution uh, says that there, there is a consolidated fund. And when I mention the word consolidated fund, it is really the piggy bank and the purse of the government. So all the revenues that you have from taxation and so many other forms will go into the consolidated fund. And this is the fund where the federal government will tap to pay for operational expenditure and for, you know, to, to develop the country. So in brief, you can only withdraw from the consolidated fund in three manners. Number one, if that expenditure is charged on the consolidated fund, uh, B, if it is authorized by a supply bill or, or supply act, uh, and if it's authorized to be issued under Article 102. So let us just go deeper into these three categories. So uh, number one, expenditure charge on the consolidated fund. This is uh, essentially expenditures for officers which the constitution deems should be independent and free from any political influence. So this is the, for example, officers of the YDPA, of the speakers of parliament, of the members of the EC, of the judges. The idea behind this is of course that their remuneration should not be decided by those in political office so that those people in political office cannot exert influence upon these people. So it's pretty straightforward what these expenditures are. So if it's charged the consolidated fund, then you have to pay to these officers no matter what. Even if within one day does not pass a budget to you know, pay for all of these officers, the constitution says that you have to pay them nonetheless. Uh, number two is the more uh, anticipated supply acts and these are the budgets that are presented normally by the finance minister at the beginning of every financial year. So we have seen this uh, when Lim Guan Eng presented budget 2020. Uh, it is tried that any expenditure by the government should be tabled through the supply act. So whatever expenditure that the Ministry of Education gets, Ministry of Health gets, at the beginning of the year, you're supposed to table a supply bill. If you want to spend more than what has been allocated in that supply bill, you need to table a supplementary supply bill. And uh, I think this is where the government has 
fallen short in that it did not table a supplementary supply bill, but instead chose to announce that they will allocate uh, $25 billion in the stimulus package. Uh, we don't know where the $25 billion is coming from. Uh, is it from the GLCs or for some kind of private financing initiative that we don't know about? Or is it from the consolidated fund? So we're not really even sure where the government is tapping this money from to pay and to inject into the economy. And that is a question mark that we need to answer. And of course, C is Article 102 or expenditures. So I think what the constitution envisages in 102 is that there may be circumstances where there is, there is unusual urgency that parliament uh, cannot convene to debate a very detailed supply bill. So it allows the parliament to pass a very simple uh, supply bill without going through the nitty gritty and the technicalities that is required under the constitution, including the part where you need to identify with sufficient certainty and sufficient detail what you are spending on. So I think these are the emergency provisions that unfortunately the government uh, didn't really rely on. So in just from a constitutional point of view, I think the government really needs to explain, number one, where the money is coming from, and number two, why is not choosing to table a supplementary supply bill uh, when all other jurisdictions, uh, most modern democracies around the world have already done that. Uh, in the US, Australia, Singapore, the UK, you name it. So Malaysia remains the, one of the only Commonwealth countries that have unilaterally announced through the executive whatever stimulus packages it wants to combat COVID-19. When we look at the experiences of other countries, we do see that there is great value in tabling a supplementary bill in Parliament or in Senate in the case of the US. So for example, in the US, uh, there is a 2.2 trillion coronavirus bill that was passed in Congress uh, and eventually by the House. But at the Congress stage, Democrats you know, mounted their opposition. They wanted to improve a lot of aspects of the coronavirus bill and they did indeed improve on it. So for example, if you can see from this slide, they have expanded unemployment benefits to 250 billion uh, because prior to this, the, re the Republican version of the bill was deemed to be too pro-company and not pro-employee enough. And the Democrats have you know, negotiated for that kind of provision to be improved. And number two, they have created an inspector to oversee a particular commission to uh, distribute funds for particularly distressed industries. So when it comes to accountability on how the money is to be spent, the Democrats have indeed improved upon the bill by creating an inspector and also a congressionally approved board. And number three, and this is quite interesting, they have also managed to include a provision to pro forbid President Trump or his family members or any other top government officials from tapping into those loans and investments from the stimulus package. So this is an example of how a bipartisan approach, uh, which may take a little bit longer, no doubt, but if the ultimate product is a more nuanced and effective and improved bill, then there is certainly great value in having bipartisan support. And not only bipartisan, you know, government backbenchers may have better ideas than what the executive, ha executive has at the end of the day. So their input is also important. But even if uh, we do not improve on certain aspects of the bill, uh, there is also great value in debating the bill in parliament. So for example, in Singapore, uh, Finance Minister Heng Siegwe tabled the resilience budget. Uh, Although at the end of the day, there was no change to the resilience budget pursuant to opposition debate, uh, opposition workers, parties, members of parliament are able to hold him to account and to ask him to explain about certain aspects of the bill which may not be that clear to the public. So for example, they pointed out uh, several questions to improve the wage support scheme. So as you know, uh, Singapore does some subsidize the wages of certain industries more than others. So for example, for the exhibition and convention industry, up to 70%, 75% wage support is provided. 
but uh, Sylvia Lim, the opposition party member or part member of parliament, managed to query, you know, why operators of mice venues qualify for 75%, but contractors who provide mice specific products only get 25%. So it is a matter of, you know, improving the wage support scheme to cater across all industries, across all supply chains. And number two, uh, they also queried to ensure that public resources are not abused. So for example, when airlines get a 75% enhanced wage support, is there an obligation to review the already implemented no pay leave arrangements that the airlines have arranged for employees? You know, so the idea is, since you've already received support from government, are you still obliged to cut pay of employees or to retrench employees? So these are legitimate questions that oppositions can raise uh, through parliament. And that's where it gets aired to the public, into the media. And that's where, you know, bills can be approved. The government may look into these issues and may address these issues in a supplementary bill, for example. Uh, so that in gist encapsulates what I'm trying to tell to the public, which is that you have to comply with the constitution. And number two, there is a lot of value in opposition input and even government backbencher input. Uh, back to you, Ira. Thank you. Thanks, Wejet, for that very comprehensive overview and also uh, very useful to see what other democracies have done. And, um, and you know, in the case of the US and Singapore, where uh, there's been great value added, actually, by the opposition when um, uh, such uh, stimulus packages have been, uh, have been uh, put up for debate and scrutiny, right? So I just have one question for you, which is, um, I think the Prime Minister did mention uh, that once Parliament convenes on the 18th of May, uh, that the package will be tabled uh, and, and debated. Uh, that's what he said. Uh, my question is, um, it, how useful would that be when uh, many of the many of the programs, many of the cash handouts and, and all that has already uh, been implemented and has already been carried out and rightly so because a lot of people out there need help immediately. Uh, so what's the value of it being debated later, uh, Bridget? I think the problem with that kind of maneuver is that, like you rightfully pointed out, some monies have already spent and monies have already gone to the pockets of people and they've already spent it on groceries, for example. In the hypothetical scenario that the opposition manages to prevent the bill from being passed, what is the government to do? Are they supposed to claw back all of those expenditure, you know? It doesn't make sense that way. I think the more prudent way is to debate it in parliament, get it approved, and then spend on it. Uh, you are right to say that we need to get it fast and we need to get it quickly done, uh, but that is no excuse to evade accountability and complying with the law and when it comes to stimulus packages. Oh, okay. Yes, I really thank you, Ajit, for that uh, uh, great presentation. Uh, Trisha, over to you. Uh, and Trisha will uh, cover the topic of fiscal accountability of the stimulus package. Over to you. Okay, um, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, very glad to see so many of you joining us this morning. Um, I think Wejet has touched a little bit on, on the fiscal parts, but she, he took a, a lot more of a constitutional approach. Um, but before I get into my, my slides, which I do have some to share with you, uh, maybe at the outset, uh, I should mention that, um, you know, we have to recognize that, that we are operating in under unprecedented, um, you know, uh, it's an unprecedented environment and a condition that government is approaching. And I don't think um, that they had a previous SOP uh, to, to follow. And uh, the second thing I would say is that um, the fiscal stimulus that has been announced, I mean, it's, it's, it is a warranted measure, uh, but I think that we're not debating today the, the value of the fiscal stimulus itself. We're looking at um, the democratic aspects of the fiscal uh, stimulus package. Um, and so I'll just put it out there that uh, I, I think it's, it's a wise and necessary move for the government to announce uh, stimulus packages given the economic impact that the country is going to face among uh, various sectors, businesses, communities, and so on. Okay, and so with that, uh, let me 
share with you my screen. Um, okay, I hope, is everyone seeing this? Okay, I hope you can see that. Um, so the title that was given to us was uh, Delivering with Democracy. And I just wanted to add in that the way I'm seeing it is that we need to uh, ensure that while the government is acting on these uh, measures, it has to also do this through public accountability. And uh, yes, it's an, it's an emergency situation. Uh, many people have likened it to a sort of a wartime scenario, but um, that doesn't mean, uh, echoing what Wei Jet said, that we should not therefore uh, still deliver with the kind of democratic uh, principles that we should uphold our politicians on. Okay. Um, so I have five points and I hope I won't take too long. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, you see the word transparency a lot on, on this slide, essentially because I think that this is what it means when you are supposed to deliver with democracy and transparency and accountability are the key uh, mandates that we need to, to hold government to. So I will talk about fiscal transparency. I'll spend a, a bit more time on that and then I'll, I'll touch upon the other things like procurement, um, you know, consultations with state governments, budget transparency, and also a bigger picture transparent decision-making process. So the key questions I want to ask, which is similar to what Rajat said earlier, is number one, how much is the fiscal injection? Uh, number two, where will the funds come from? And number three, how will this affect Malaysia's debt to GDP ratio and as well as the budget deficit, um, which are things that I think we have already been struggling with, you know, given the economic conditions that Malaysia came into even before the COVID-19 situation hit us. So um, just to give you a kind of overview of what we're looking at, before the COVID-19 situation, uh, the original target that the Malaysian government had was a 3.2% uh, fiscal deficit. That's a percentage of the GDP. So the first time that the fiscal stimulus was announced, uh, this was actually announced by Mahathir. So this is, you see the date, the 27th of February, before the change of government took place on the 1st of March. So um, a 20 billion package was announced and most of it was targeted at the tourist, uh, tourism industry. Um, the fiscal stimulus was probably only about 2 billion out of that 20. And the expectation was that it would increase our deficit to 3.4%. And um, there's uh, a series of nice charts here, which I have to credit a refsa for, which shows that um, at that time, the, the stimulus package was only 1.2% of GDP, which is quite small relative to the other countries. And then on the 27th of March, uh, Mohidin announced this very big, you know, 200 50 billion um, package, but out of that, we know that only 25 billion was a fiscal stimulus. And then they revised their fiscal deficit to 4%. So you can see that um, the chart's a little bit small, but I can share the slides uh, with whoever's interested later. And this um, represented 6.1% of the GDP. And then finally, you have um, the additional one, which the government just announced uh, just a few days ago, 10 billion announced out of which was, I think it was an 8 billion fiscal stimulus. They weren't clear about it. I had to make my own calculations. And um, the, the, the fiscal deficit is expected to grow to 4.7%. So you can see that um, I just wanted to put it out there uh, that this is the amount that the government is putting in uh, with regards to fiscal stimulus. So, um, so, okay, what has the government said in response to where the money is coming from? So Tunku Zafro, our Minister of Finance, has been quoted to say that uh, there will be a bit of reallocation with the ministries and the rest we have through the government ecosystem. He said this a few times and the remainder will be from borrowings. And then um, most recently, he also said that um, the direct fiscal injection is 35 billion and it would come from funds and domestic borrowing. So this is all he has said. Um, but my question is, you know, how much exactly are we talking about? You know, it's not enough for us to, to make these rather uh, vague terms, uh, especially when you're talking about, about fiscal transparency and accountability. So I, that's a question that I would like to pose uh, to the Minister of Finance. So um, these are the potential sources of funding which, um, which are, are possibly available for government. The first is uh, the contingency, contingencies fund. And I think there's a, maybe some slight disagreement um, 
with Wayjet, but we can work it out later during the Q&A. Uh, so the Financial Procedures Act says that contingencies funds may be drawn from uh, to meet un uh, an urgent and unforeseen need for expenditure for which no other provision exists. Um, and so the recent budget did allocate $2 billion to the contingencies fund, but note that this was only for development and not for operations. The other um, possibility is for the budget 2020 to be reallocated. Um, but I think as my other panelists will agree that this will have to go through parliament because you know parliament has already agreed upon this amount of money being set for this purpose. Um, and any kind of reallocation will need to go to par Parliament for accountability purposes. And I know that Parliament should not physically meet, but I also think that this is the time that the government needs to be a bit more creative about how it meets. Maybe they need to have social distancing you know, measures within Parliament itself, or alternatively, in other countries, they're also already asking uh, for virtual parliamentary meetings and sessions. And all this we know is possible through technology. I mean, just the way that you're listening to me right now. So I don't think it's impossible. Um, an additional point is that the Financial Procedures Act prohibits uh, violent within ministries out of the budget, meaning that uh, you can possibly do reallocations between ministries. It's unclear about that, but within the ministry, you're not supposed to make any uh, you know, reallocations within ministries. So if they're not gonna reallocate, then the third option is to borrow, right? Which is what um, the Minister of Finance implied, that some of it will be funded through domestic borrowing. So then the question will be, how will this impact on the debt to GDP ratio? Because currently, uh, our ratio is 52.7%, uh, which is below the 55% self-imposed limit that the, that the government has. And um, we know that the fiscal rules prevent government from borrowing uh, for operating expenditure and also that within a certain financial year, the operating expenditures cannot exceed revenue. So, so these are the rules that set out you know, what the government can and cannot do. But the key question is, you know, government needs to be transparent about where, how much of it is coming from where, and uh, that's the fiscal transparency part. Okay, my second point is on procurement transparency. Um, in the speech that Muhyiddin, uh, you know, made on the 27th of March, that was the, the big package, he did talk about small projects that are going to be used um, for, you know, construction purposes, like 2 billion for upgrading of roads, schools, police stations, and 64.4 million for agro-food industry. Uh, this is still relatively small uh, when you think about the larger package, but my point is that um, there will be some procurement that will need to be done. And because it's so urgent that it has to be done immediately, um, one also needs to be very circumspect as to how it's being done. Uh, we also know that other projects will be carrying on like ECRL, MRT2, um, the National Fiberization and Connectivity Plan. Um, we know we're in a crisis situation, so procurement needs to balance between efficiency, meaning that these things need to be done. We know that uh, for the beneficiaries to, to take advantage of that. But also there needs to be transparency. There cannot be you know, a situation where, okay, this needs to be done, therefore um, there's no accountability whatsoever. Uh, I just want to add a small point. It's not in the stimulus package per se, but um, a transparent process of medical supplies procurement is also crucial. And we know that a lot of that is happening right now, um, given the needs from the hospitals and, and under MOH. So uh, that's my second point. Okay, I try to move a little bit uh, more quickly because I have a few more points to get through. So the third thing is that, um, you know, we, we've seen a lot about how uh, the federal government is making decisions, but I don't know whether consultations are taking place with the state governments. And why is that important? Because we know that SMEs and the business sector are, are the most you know, impacted upon, apart from the vulnerable groups, of course. Um, and we know that many of these SMEs are actually located in states like Selangor and Penang. Uh, in fact, the largest number of SMEs are in Selangor. So we also know that these are opposition state governments. So I guess the question and what I would urge would be that consultations are needed between federal and state governments, regardless of political affiliation in providing adequate support to uh, the SME sector. And they should also be able to work alongside state governments, uh, regardless of political affiliation, again, and coordinating at the community levels, because who is actually the most impacted? You're talking about the communities and vulnerable groups at the bottom, where uh, local councils and you know, your, your ketua kampongs um, have the greatest access to them. So 
this third point is about consultations and, and decision making should not just be central and top down. And I don't think enough of that is happening. Um, the fourth point is on budget transparency and reporting. So we know that on the 16th of March, um, government set up under MOF this uh, unit called Lapsana. Uh, it's it's uh, the unit for the implementation and coordination of national agencies on the economic stimulus package. Just um, quite a mouthful. Uh, and it's headed by National Budget Office Director, uh, Johan Merican. So we know that they'll be preparing periodic reports on the implementation of the stimulus package, but it's only going to be presented to the Economic Action Council, which is chaired by the Prime Minister. So uh, what I would urge is that these you know, intermittent reports, as well as final reports, need to be provided to the public. Um, it's not enough that only the Prime Minister gets to see how the stimulus package was rolled out. Um, the public should have access to these reports as well. And what should it include? It should include analysis of you know, take up rates, um, how many SMEs applied for the loans, how many got them, you know, what was the basis upon which the, the loans were given out, uh, how are the GLCs being used, and uh, you know, how is the interministerial coordination taking place, who is deciding what really. So I think it's really important that you know, at the end of all this, and of course we hope that it ends soon, uh, at the end of all this, we need to know what actually happened during you know, these, these turbulent, crazy times. Um, we have to be able to take stock of, of uh, you know, what, what would have happened um, over the past whatever X number of months that this will go on for. Okay, uh, my final point is a, it's a bigger picture point about how I think um, transparent decision-making frameworks need to be available for the public. Uh, so what do, what do we know? We know that, say, the National Security Council is in charge of the, the movement control order. We know that the Economic Action Council, together with the Prime Minister, I suppose, or he chairs the EAC, um, is making decisions on the stimulus package. But uh, that, that's, that's all we really know. I mean, we don't know whether, uh, you know, decisions are being made with, the entire cabinet? Um, is there a sort of bipartisan consultation going on? Um, are the opposition parliamentarians being brought in at all for discussion? And because this is a long term, um, what, we, what we believe to be a very long term situation, so there will be some forward planning that's needed. So then the question is, you know, how much stimulus is going to be required in the next six to 12 months? So I think the government is in a situation where it really needs to balance between democratic governance, economic viability, public health concerns and community needs. And I don't envy the situation the government is in, uh, but what we do need to ensure is that while all this is happening during this crisis and emergency mode, uh, we must not forget the, the, the democratic uh, governance and public accountability measures. So I'm just going to sum it up all by uh, putting this together. Uh, just let me repeat that um, we need to have fiscal transparency. Uh, qu more questions need to be asked about the details of the stimulus packages. Uh, there must be ongoing procurement transparency and governance. Um, that must not stop. The scrutiny must not stop. Uh, consultations with state governments, regardless of political affiliation, um, reporting, public reporting and a, a bigger transparent decision-making framework. You know, how are they making decisions? And with that, uh, I thank you. Thank you very much, Trisha. Um, managed to pack in uh, quite a lot of things actually in your, in your presentation. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I, have, uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Okay, I have um, just one question to follow up on that, which is, uh, I like what you said about how procurement during these challenging times needs to be a balance between efficiency and transparency. And I would just like to ask you, um, what are, are there actually provisions at the moment in our uh, procurement rules to uh, account for times like emergency times like this? Um, and and uh, has has the government ever needed to use it before uh, at all? Okay, uh, so your, your question is whether the procurement rules um, 
uh, allow for any emergency use of funds? I actually don't know the answer to that because... Uh, Trisha, how... did you hear my question? Yeah, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm answering it right now. Um, can you hear me? Can, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so my answer to that was um, because the procurement regulations are, um, are quite multifold, um, that there isn't just one, you know, big procurement act, which, which by the way, the government is supposed to table in parliament um, under the National Action Corruption Plan. There is a government procurement act that is supposed to table. Um, and I believe that it should include things like this because I don't think that uh, emergency measures are included in, in the current uh, procurement regulation. So there are many, many regulations and circulars that the MOF has, which are distributed throughout the country. So state governments also need to comply with these regulations and circulars. Um, but I, I may be wrong on that count. Uh, I, I need to, to check on that for you because I do recall that uh, there were certain instances in the past in the Slangon government, for instance, when um, there was water shortages where there was some need to procure quickly. But um, again, I, I don't know the specific answer to that, to that question, but I, I would check on that for you. Thanks. Wong Chen, why don't you go ahead to, to okay. take... Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, thanks for being here. I will just uh, give a five to 10 minute, possibly 15 minute speech on this issue. Uh, I've been asked to speak about accountability, but let me address the basic questions that a lot of people want to know. Uh, how big is this uh, stimulus package in actual fact? Uh, as Trisha and also uh, Wei Jet has already said earlier, it's around 35 billion at the moment. Yeah, And it's supposed to come from uh, so-called the, the, the new finance minister. It's going to come from some sort of moving of the OPEX around. For instance, like the tourism budget, we know that Tourism Malaysia uh, program is now short to pieces. So they have you know a few hundred million to move around. So basically they're saying that they're going to move around some operating expenditure and even let me do it the DVEX later okay but operating expenditure they're going to move it to uh to this COVID-19 stimulus package now obviously that's not going to be enough yeah you can cut off 10 20 percent of all OPEX and still it's going to be like 10 billion or 15 billion at most you can save okay if you want to move it to COVID-19 now so they're going to look to Petronas that's pretty obvious they're going to look to EPF. Now, Petronas has a problem. I'll deal with that later because, you know, as you know, oil prices are not great. It's rebounding a bit. But generally, uh, the, the, the analysis out there believes that at 25, 26 US dollar per barrel, that is the cost of, cost of our production. So we're not looking at a lot of money to come from Petronas. Yeah. So the most likely uh, usual suspect is going to be Co-op and EPF to have to pick up a lot of bonds from Malaysia. Yeah, they are also looking at the GLCs and some agencies to support this. For instance, Bank Negara was uh, asked to uh, cough out an extra billion in dividends, so they've agreed to, to do so. Uh, we're not sure how the other uh, GLCs are going to do that, whether they are able or not. Most When we track GLCs, the, their performance are not fantastic. You know, their, their returns about 2% a year, so we'll have to see whether that can be done or not. Yeah, so basically 35 billion do they need to spend the 35 billion today no it is roughly a three months program so we can put a simple estimate that it will cost basically 10 billion a month yeah so by the end of this month they would have spent close to 10 billion as you know parliament will sit again on the 18th of may and that being the case there is up to 18 of may they will probably spend 10 maximum 12 13 billion so i don't think it's going to be a, a big problem in that sense for them to come and introduce a supplementary uh, budget or even to recalibrate the budget itself. Yeah? So there is a parliamentary process on that. And I'm sure that the prime minister and the new government uh, don't want to start off with you know, trying to uh, get out of the situation by not being transparent and that they will fully engage us. So I'm not terribly worried at that point. Yeah? Now, there are some basic government rules that they cannot break. One is whether the DVEX development expenditure, which is about 50, 60 billion a year, can it be shifted back to operating expenditure or can it be used as part of the uh, COVID-19 stimulus package? That is a question that 
probably very technical and probably the, the accountant general will have to advise them, but I'm sure they're going to tap into it. Yeah, they will have to tap into it. Because as a basic rule, uh, there's, there's, on top of that, there's another rule that they have to apply, uh, which is basically all income tax and revenues coming to government must be sufficient to cover OPEX, operating expenditure of the government. Yeah? Now, that is not a written rule, but that is just a rule of thumb. And, and they continuously say this. So as a political point of view, they have to state it. So they will, they will come to parliament and say, okay, situation has changed. As Tricia say, you know, you must give them some leeway because, you know, there's no point arguing all technicalities when the, when the real purpose of the whole thing is to make sure that we get the money out into the system and to save the economy. So we will expect them to come and say, look, uh, we need to move some DVEX into OPEX and that we need to suspend the rule that all income taxes and revenue, uh, you know, should be sufficient to cover OPEX alone. Therefore, you know, we have to go into that area and debate about it. Now, the overriding issue is whether the one that raised by uh, Trisha is whether the 55 ceiling of government debt to GDP uh, is going to be maintained or not. As you know, uh, the debt level is about 800 billion at the moment, yeah, national debt level. So uh, to cross 55%, if we accept that the GDP is 1.6 trillion, we need to raise, they need to cross over 880 billion. So the moment they cross over 880 billion, they actually have to go to parliament and get a vote on it because this is a, they need to amend, I think through the finance bill or not, not finance, but the finance act that they have to get this done, the 55% if they, if they breach it. Are they going to, so roughly 80 billion, right? So we here we have a stimulus package with actual injection of 35 billion. So they are short, if they are they going to cross another 45 billion to trigger the 55% ceiling of government debt to GDP? I think they're going to. I really think so because by looking at all the other countries out there, uh, they are the responsible countries, the one that have uh, an actual plan going ahead, is they need to spend roughly and inject cash roughly 10% of GDP. So in the Malaysian terms, uh, we're looking at 1.6 trillion GDP. Therefore, they need to spend 160 billion. So they will definitely cross, cross the 80 billion mark at one point, maybe three months down the line, four months down the line, we're not sure. But I think it is safe now to say, uh, you know, all this has to do with time frame. So we've got to put it in proper context. It's now safe to say that this crisis is going to last for at least six months. Yeah, at least six months. The MCO may, may uh, end a bit earlier, maybe 60 days, if you base on the Wuhan, China, uh, you know, methodology. Uh, you may have some relaxation of the MCO, but you've got to prepare overall for six months. We know this because the actuarial scientists from all the banks, that's why the banks give you that moratorium for six months. <laughs> it's, it's a six months thing. They estimate by the best estimate by actuarial scientists is that this crisis will be six months. So therefore, we think that it will hit, it, during that period, the government need to pump in a lot more money up to about 160 billion. Uh, now, they could sit back and say, I don't want to pump it, uh, but I think that would be, that would be just bad for everybody. I, I actually am, uh, am supportive if the government need to spend more. But of course, the whole point of today's uh, web, web seminar is really talk about the accountability aspect of that, yeah? Now, let me address very quickly the fiscal challenges ahead for the financial year 2020. A lot of people ask where it's going to come from. It has to come from EPF. It has to come from, uh, from I don't think there are any foreign buyers of bonds, Malaysian bonds. So it will be back to us. Yeah. Now, what are the fiscal challenges for the year 2020? We know if uh, oil revenue continue at this rate and oil revenue contribute about 50 billion a year and about another 17 billion in petroleum income tax every year. So we're looking at possibly halving of all that. So we're looking at 30 billion short from PITA and also from Petronas contribution. That's a rough estimate, yeah? Now, income tax. Now, if we lose a lot of, a lot of people lose jobs, then that's gonna have an impact on income tax, personal income tax. But corporate tax itself is 70 billion a year. I'm sure uh, most, any accountants out there will tell you or business people, including you know, my family, my friends who are business people, uh, they, are, they are not likely to report any real income tax coming in. So we're looking at maybe possibly a 50 billion shortfall in income tax next year. 
Yeah. So we're looking at 50 billion, another 30 billion, possibly from PITA and all those. You're roughly looking at plus minus 80 to 100 billion shortfall in the government fiscal uh, position by the for the year 2020. So those are the real challenges. Yeah. Now let's talk about the accountability issue, which is what I've been uh, asked to talk about uh, at, at, at this uh, web seminar. So accountability in terms of parliament, uh, we just have to understand it in very simple simple uh, uh, three steps. The first one is by looking at the scope of work the parliamentary itself. The first one is you have to look at the laws because we pass, we legislate. So whether the laws that need to come through during this stimulus package, uh, whether there's going to be an amendment to the debt ceiling 55%, that will be done through the debate and policy uh, arguments, right? Okay, so that's the law bit. Now on the policy front, so parliamentary has got three jobs, by the way. First, we'll pass the law. Second is to look at policies. And third one is to approve the budget. Yeah? On the policy front, accountability is really locked into the select committee system. Because you know, select committees are there to check the government's policy making process. Now, as you know, Pakatan Harapan came in and we created some select committees. Uh, but most of them are not really direct ministerial committees. So we have a lot of uh, shortcoming on that front. Uh, so even the committee system, which Today still exists. I'm still the chairman of the International Trade Committee, but we're just not functional because we can't hold meetings because Parliament is really, uh, you know, due to the MCO and all that, we can't really do anything. We are there for a two year appointment. The moment we reseat Parliament and Parliament uh, operational gets back into full mode, we could possibly question, I mean, I could question MITI and question uh, foreign MOFA. Uh, on their budget and their COVID-19 spending. Well, MOFA won't really have anything, but MITI would we have some in there. Yeah, so policy making are still intact in that sense. But but there is a proviso. They could come in and then just, you know, remove all the committees and reappoint new people into place. So we, we don't know what's the situation on that. Now, accountability on the budget front. As you know, we have the Public Accounts Committee, and the Public Accounts Committee is a reactive committee. So if they spend the money now, and if there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, wrong spending, for instance, like this Prihatin thing, where members of parliament can actually receive a thousand six hundred, <laughs> that kind of thing, right? Then the select the the Public Accounts Committee can summon them, but this is about six months to nine months down the line. So this is a reactive committee in that sense. So the real budget if it's going to be spent by, by the new government, uh, what can, the, uh, can we do is we can debate in parliament. That has, of course, uh, minimal impact sometimes. Uh, we can try to block supplementary budgets or we can look at you know, recalibration debates. Those are the things that we have to do. But I like to stress that select committees, in fact, uh, if we had done the proper job, Pakatan Harap had done the proper job back in the one, one and a half years earlier, then we could have get, given the power for select committees, uh, ministerial select committees to check ministerial spending. So for instance, if Doraemon wants to spend some money, we can actually have a, somebody in the Doraemon uh, select committee to actually ask them the final questions on how is she spending those money. Yeah, okay. Now, so as, is, as long as parliament is not sitting, we are not, uh, they're not really accountable to us. Yeah, so we have to wait for May 18. In the meantime, we go back to the standard system of accountability, which is to engage the media. I put a lot of, lot of things on Facebook. I don't talk to the media anymore, but they pick it up and write about whatever I put on Facebook. So this kind of thing do happen. Uh, then uh, lawsuits, you can also take up lawsuits, you know, and, and where the judiciary plays the final role of, uh, of seeing whether the government is accountable or not. Yeah, now lastly, uh, I'm sure we, we, may have a problem even on the May 18th, whether we can actually do a parliamentary sitting or not, depend on the MCO. Uh, but I think parliament rules are very simple. You need 26 to have a quorum. So if you do a Zoom or web seminar like this, you can easily get 26 members of parliament in. We could schedule time for parliamentarians to debate. Uh, we could schedule time for ministers to reply. So I think I agree with Tricia and also with uh, Rajat that we can actually do all this by the internet and it can be done. Yeah, but we do have two problems. One is the standing orders. The standing orders need to be a bit more flexible and may require amendment or maybe the government, uh, the, the speaker has the power to 
override the standing order in special circumstances. This one we need, we need to look into a bit more carefully. But the real problem is this. I'm sure the new government wants to replace the speaker. That is why organizing a Zoom now under the current speaker might be a bit difficult, you know? Or and organizing virtual thing needs to be is difficult because the appointment of the speaker requires the vote of all parliamentarians in parliament to be done. Yeah. So, um, so that's uh, that's basically. It. So I, I hope to answer your questions on any other issues. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, YB Wong Chen, uh, for covering quite a lot actually, uh, in in your in your remarks. Um, I think uh, there are actually quite a number of questions uh, from the audience, which is great. Uh, so I think since uh, we have some time, so maybe uh, we could uh, we could there's a uh, we could take some questions uh, live um, from this. The first one is actually from Dr. Albert J. Raj. So he is asking about um, the current stimulus package. How will it benefit SMEs? Uh, and will the government look into this to ensure that the riot will be well taken care of? So I think um, the government actually did uh, launch a stimulus package uh, specifically for the SMEs. Uh, maybe this is a question that maybe um, YB Wong Chen, would you like to, to take this one, your perspective on SMEs? Okay, thank you. Yeah, the SMEs uh, is quite simple. The SMEs need to be able to survive for the next three months or so. Um, you know, I mean, that's the urgent phase, okay? The MCO, I think it's fair to say that it's very likely to extend until the end of this month. Lah. Okay, I wouldn't say <laughs> whether it's going to extend until the end of May. But uh, during that period, uh, the biggest factor or biggest cost for any SME is really wages, yeah? So wages will be somewhere between, uh, in the, the mean or median will be around 50%. Yeah, so the government stimulus package, the additional ten billion for wage subsidy is quite good, but let me say this: it if you put it in the proper context, it that's a thousand two hundred support system. Yeah, some six hundred eight hundred thousand two represents roughly about twenty five percent or thirty percent only of wage support in actual in actual terms. Yeah. When you look at Netherlands, you look at the uh, Norwegian countries up there, up north, uh, they're, they're looking at support wages of between 75% to 90%. Uh, in Singapore, they are doing close to about, if I'm right, about 25 to 50 or 60%. Uh, so we need to still put in a lot more wage subsidy. Yeah, If you put in a wage subsidy, the key point is this. The uh, corporations are thinking three months, I will have to close shop lah if I don't have any more real revenue. So they have to be incentivized to believe that this problem is not more than three months and that revenue will, come, will start trickling in in the fourth month, fifth month, sixth month. But if they sack people now, in the fourth month when the revenue start coming in, they have to rehire people, it's too much trouble. So they have to come to a, to a mechanism where the wage support is, is a more beneficial than sacking people and rehiring later. So if you can deal with that, this is why I always tell the, the uh, ministers out there to engage the SME in, you know, in real terms, in, in like look at their business model and see how they're going to survive and what are, their, what are they thinking. I know a lot of companies out there are thinking of how to beat the tax system, close the company, transfer asset, restart new companies and all that. WayJet probably going to make a lot of money advising them over that period. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, uh, YB. Uh, I, Widget, uh, there are, I think, a few questions that uh, you can address, so I will uh, just kind of uh, bunch them together. So the first one is, um, does the government have powers to increase surveillance for tracking and enforcing quarantine? Uh, which, is a, which is a very uh, important question now. And I think there's another one, which you touched on briefly during your presentation, uh, which is, what if the stimulus package does not get parliamentary approval, right? So what will happen then? So, Wejet, over to you. Okay, on the first question, does the government have powers to increase surveillance for tracking and enforcing quarantine? I presume uh, the question would cover situations where the government will tap into your phones, into your or any other communication systems to monitor people moving from point A to point B, 
my simple answer to that is that you cannot. Uh, my understanding of the laws is that the government may only intercept communication when they suspect an offence is being committed and there must be reasonable basis for that suspicion. So if they really do suspect that uh, this uncle is going to go out from his home to travel more than 10 kilometers in breach of the uh, MCO, then they possibly can tap into his communications. But they cannot be a blanket system where you are able to tap everyone and monitor everyone. That is not provided for under the Criminal Procedure Code or under the law. If the government wants to do that, I think you have to pass legislation to do that. Um, US may have powers to do that, but I don't think in Malaysia the police or the authorities have the power to do that. Uh, the second question uh, relates to, is it a question on what if the, what if the budget is not approved in parliament? Right, Ira? Yes, so the question was, uh, so what, uh, assuming that the stimulus package does get, uh, through, gets, get debated in parliament on the 18th of May, uh, what will happen if it does not get parliamentary approval? Well, well the, if you do not get parliamentary approval, then practically well, the government would have to table another budget to try to get it passed uh, to perhaps one which is catered for what the opposition demands for. Or if, it really, if you really can't pass, I, I really don't see practically how you're able to claw back whatever financial stimulus that has already been injected and has already gone to the pockets of businesses and, industry and individuals. Uh, but that is a practical issue that has to be resolved. I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but that is also the reason why I feel you should pass a budget first before you spend. Uh, I can give, it's akin to, to not passing a law first and then enforcing the law and then finding out later that actually I don't have powers to you know, do this to a certain person. That really doesn't make any sense to me. Um, Thank you. Uh, actually, Trisha, sorry, yeah, you were like something to add? I wanted to jump in there. So, um, Rejan, are you saying that if the government doesn't pass a law and goes ahead to spend funds that it did not pass uh, in Parliament, can there be any action taken post expenditure? I mean, essentially what you're saying is that the government is doing something illegal. Well, I mean, on a theoretical level, I mean, the opposition or any other person for that matter could file a claim in court to say that, well, look, this is an unlawful expenditure. Uh, I'm asking for uh, orders for the government to revert, to draw back all the funds that has been spent back into the consolidated fund. That theoretically is one measure which I could think of, but I, I'm not sure whether we want to go down that road. Yeah, it's also possibly very uh, politically incorrect to do that. Yeah. Whether you're coming from a government party or opposition parties. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to respond to your question earlier, Ira, about the procurement uh, issue. So actually in Mahathir's uh, last speech uh, during the stimulus announcement, he actually increased the procurement threshold value uh, for balloting from 50,000 ringgit to 100,000 ringgit and for quotations from 500,000 ringgit to 800,000 ringgit. Uh, essentially, that it makes it more, it's, it's a more flexible regime in which um, the, the government does not need to, well, basically the procurement threshold ha had been revised in the last stimulus announcement. And um, although there are no specific rules on emergency, which was your specific question, um, the, the emergency situation can exempt government from open tender where they can do direct negotiation. And I do have to thank my uh, fellow fellow who co-wrote uh, the article with me for, for some of those responses. Um, I have a question that I also wanted to address here by an anonymous attendee. So the question was asking about these kinds of discussions can be perceived as very elitist, you know, this thing about democratic accountability, uh, when actual fact the people on the ground are just wanting the stimulus to be rolled out and, and fairly so. I mean, we understand that the most urgent need is economic, which is what I said during my presentation. So how do you bring this message across? I mean, it is the same message that anyone who is talking about 
accountability and uh, you know democratic principles should uphold regardless of being in crisis. Uh, and that and that main message should be that as long as there is not accountability, um, the funds are not going to be spent wisely. So a lot more money is going to be put in the hands of middlemen, uh, pocketed by, you know, individuals or firms that are not actually doing the jobs, and less of that money is going to the actual people who need it. So in the same way that we address it during normal times is exactly the same way and even more importantly so in the, in crisis times uh, that that's my answer Hi. thank you can, can, thanks Trisha. go ahead YB. yeah okay let, let, let me jump. yeah just just to pick on Trisha's point in times of crisis there are going to be a lot of opportunities okay so we do need to have at least some standards of accountability while speed is important they have to account for it either three months down the line through PAC or six months or whatever it is, but definitely through the parliamentary system and through the budget. Now, if they fail, and this is to answer Wajet's uh, initial question on the question of whether if you cannot pass a, a finance bill, what happens? If the parliament uh, rejects the finance bill, the government actually topples. The government actually is suspended. It can't really operate anymore. So it, then it becomes a question of political uh, you know, maneuvering by all the political parties. I don't think anybody wants to so-called uh, jam up the system uh, to, to score political points when people actually need money to be, to be filtered out. But theoretically and, and in practical terms, if you don't pass a finance bill, your government is now suspended or defunct and possibly you have to go for election or you have to resign en masse or you have to restructure something. So they won't reach to that stage, I can assure you. During the parliamentary process, we will debate all the way. If they don't have the numbers, they will make adjustments, they will approach us, they say, look, can we do something? What do you want? So I, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah? Okay, but, but the theoretically, they have to, the government actually suspended because they don't have the money to spend. Thank you. Thanks, YB. Um, I'm just going to, uh, uh, now that we are uh, on these points, I would like to just um, bunch up some questions for YB Wong Chen as well here. Uh, some very good questions here. So from Shukri Shahizam, he's asking about uh, the drawing on of funds from GLICs. Is that defensible on its own? And uh, what are the medium and long-term consequences uh, on GLICs themselves? There's a second one from an anonymous attendee. Uh, do you think that new taxes are needed to pay for the stimulus? And can the PN government, does the PN government have the mandate uh, to introduce new taxes without election and a manifesto? And um, yeah, so I think those two first for you, YB Wong Chen. Hang on. Okay, thank you for the questions, yeah. GLICs, um, now GLICs are basically investment bodies. Um, they would need to sell down their equities or their holdings or their, their properties in order to fund or transfer 5 billion, 10 billion to the government. What impact would that be? I mean, they're looking at selling uh, mass, lah, as you can see. <laughs> okay, so, uh, what, what impact is this going to be? Uh, I, I don't think uh, GLCs, GLICs should come in and dispose of on a cheap sale because you could raise a lot of issues about crony capitalism, uh, someone buying something for a song, you know, in this distress time. GL, GLICs should not do that. Yeah, government in fact, in fact, should just go back to the bond market and basically ask EPF and Co-op to take up more. I think that's the better system because you never ever sell your investments in times of crisis. Yeah, and what you do is you try to hold it, or or at least uh, you know at least try to if you can pick up cheap. Yeah, so that's my advice. Now on on new taxes, where can the government issue new taxes? Of course they can. Yeah. It is it's not a manifesto thing. It's not a nothing to do with election. Uh, if they want to increase tax, they can, but I don't think they will because there's nobody out there other than the billionaires in Malaysia that actually has real money to spend it to to sustain for twelve months, right? So I think uh, that's also very unlikely to happen. What will happen is that the government will get into bigger and bigger debt. And it may not necessarily be a bad thing because the whole world is getting into bigger and bigger debt. So it's not a question of you taking a lot of debt and, you know, America's not taking debt or, or France is not taking debt. Therefore, they have more comparative advantages over you in terms of economics. Everybody has to take on more debt. 
Yeah. So I think that's just the way it is. Mm, thank you. Thanks, YB. Um, I think uh, there are some other questions that would uh, would be good to take. Um, let me just scroll down and see. Um, most of the questions are for you, YB. Uh, but please, Wayjet or Trisha, if you want to jump in, please feel free to do so. Um, there's a question on um, from an anonymous attendee. Is the current parliamentary oversight setup adequate for ensuring government's fiscal accountability during crisis time? And how can it be improved uh, in the future? And then there's another question from Shukri, which is uh, presumably uh, in a court, uh, in a case uh, where the, the court would issue a declaration that the spending is unlawful. Uh, uh, sorry, presumably in that case, the court would just issue a declaration that the spending was unlawful rather than issue a mandatory order that the funds be recovered. I think this is in reference to the uh, what happens if parliament uh, declares that the stimulus package was unlawful. So maybe won't, uh, YB and maybe Wayne as well can step in uh, later on on this. Okay, yeah, let me deal with the issue about the question number two. Um, the, if they can't pass the finance bill, the government has to go for, re, go for election. Yeah, or government operation have to suspend. Uh, you saw it in the U US where a few times the Democrats and the Republicans fought over uh, the issue about, you know, the, the budget. And then, you know, the, the entire uh, government machinery just ground to a halt while they come to a settlement, yeah? So that's, that's not likely to be settled by court. So uh, the first one is whether we have adequate uh, checks and balance under the current system. No, the answer is no. Um, we, we should, what we should have done in actual fact, uh, and, and some credit must go to Pakistan for creating up all these new select committees, but we created a lot of uh, thematic committees and not ministerial committees. There were only two or three ministerial committees out of the 11 or 12 that we created. We should have done that early. This country needs about 13 uh, ministerial committees so that fiscal spending of each individual ministers can come under the purview. So, you know, I mean, we missed the opportunity, I hope uh, by, by some miracle, this new government may want to embrace <laughs> ministerial co select committees, but that's the way forward. You really have to go there. And, and it's not enough that we debate about the budget for two months, once a year. Yeah? The spending, and it's not enough to give PAC to do all the investigation, because I sat in the PAC for a year, and there's only so much we can do. So what we need is every select committee, ministerial select committee out there to question the spending of each individual ministers. And having 13 of them, so basically, one committee sits on two ministries, monitors two ministries, then basically we will have a better system of fiscal responsibility. Thank you, YB. Um, Trisha, I would like to direct you to, there's a question on uh, the needs for accountability at the state level and between state and federal government. So you did touch upon this a bit in your presentation. So maybe you would like to, is there anything else you would like to add about the state and federal dynamic actually throughout um, this COVID crisis? Yeah, um, thanks, Ira. Uh, yeah, just to reiterate my point earlier that um, the federal government seems to be making all of the decisions and we do know that um, the, the constitution you know, empowers the federal government to do this, especially now that it's operating under the National Security Council. Um, but, you know, apart from what is constitutionally allowed for, the federal government should consult state governments because the people who are impacted live within the states and the government that is, that is best and has um, the best knowledge of what happens at the local level are the state governments and as well the local governments which state governments have control over and these are the people who um, I mean your your Kato Kampongs and your Kato community this is what I mentioned during uh, my session they are the ones who will have direct knowledge of the needs um, at, at that level uh, what else can be done I mean I think coordinating efforts would be would be also great because we do know that many of the state governments um, have announced their own stimulus packages. I think Slangor has announced the largest um, of the ones that I've seen. Um, and, you know, they want to make sure that they're not uh, over duplicating too much effort. They want to make sure that the target communities are, are the ones getting the benefits. Um, and, and also, 
the other benefit of coordinating with state governments is that the poorer states can also receive some of those benefits. So, I mean, it really is a, a no-brainer. I mean, I think consulting with the state governments and local governments is something that, that needs to be done. Um, and, and not forgetting what's happening in, in Sabah and Sarawak as well. But I do want to talk about um, this, this whole thing about oversight. Uh, yes, Parliament is a very important oversight body, but as uh, YB Wong Chen says, um, the current system and the current institution of Parliament is not robust enough. I mean, yes, there, there were some good measures taken to introduce some select committees, but um, nowhere near what the standards are in other Westminster systems where every ministry has a select committee to, to have oversight. Um, so that aside, I think we should also make use of other institutions at our disposal. So we should not forget, say, um, the Auditor General's Office, uh, which comes up with several audit, uh, audit reports throughout the year. Um, you know, there, there should be a call from, from the public to, to, to call for the Auditor General's Office to audit the stimulus package um, because of the large amounts and because of how much is being uh, disbursed over a short period of time. So I think that's another body that, that we should not forget uh, when, we're, when we're talking about institutional oversight. And uh, actually, a third thing which I thought of sharing with you um, is, let me just share my screen one more time. Hang on. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to share that there's this thing called um, the Open Government Partnership, which I think IDEAS has actually been championing for a long time. And this is a really interesting approach that um, it, it collects various efforts around the world of how government has been able to build trust with citizens. And they've collected a lot of, of answers already. You can see different countries. Uh, are, are you seeing this right now at the moment? Yeah, okay. So they've collected, I think, you know, 60 over countries examples about how uh, it's, it's both government as well as citizen-led. Some of them is citizen-led and some of them are government-led. But my point is that um, I think we can also try to push government to adopt some of these uh, open tech, digital tech technologies that they can be transparent and we can collaborate with them. Um, and it's not just going to be, you know, the onus is not entirely on the executive alone. And the other website that's also interesting is IMF, which has done a policy tracker uh, of all countries around the world in their responses to COVID-19. And I think here we can also look at examples where Malaysia can learn from in, uh, in how government has been able to do that in a, in a transparent way. Yeah. Ira, if I may just add to what Tricia has said. Uh, I think, number one, uh, yes, the federal government has jurisdiction in so far as national security and finance is concerned, uh, but public health is a concurrent list matter, which means that both the federal and state governments have jurisdiction and responsibility for. So it is a matter for both the state and federal government to work together, uh, and the state governments cannot be sidelined because public health is within their domain. Uh, number two, uh, I would think that before Parliament convenes, the other way that the opposition can hold the government accountable is, of course, through uh, the appointment of shadow cabinet members. Uh, you've seen the UK Labour Party, uh, Sir Keir Starmer, when he's, when he's selected as a new uh, opposition leader, he immediately set up his shadow cabinet and they started to you know, mount their constructive feedback to the government. Of course, on the practical level in Malaysia, uh, whether the current Pakatan Harapan lineup now is able to form a shadow cabinet is, is a practical matter which, which I don't want to dwell into. Maybe YB can shed some light to that. Thanks, Wajit and Trisha. Uh, YB, do you have anything to share about um, what is... Uh, okay, yeah, whether we're going to form a shadow cabinet, uh, I don't think so. Not, not, not at the moment because... Pakatan Harapan technically is uh, just PKR, DAP and Amana. It doesn't involve Bersatu anymore because Bersatu is in that government. But of course, there are members of Bersatu that are friendly to us. So I don't think that's going to uh, resolve itself anytime soon. Uh, so we're not likely to form a shadow cabinet. Even before GE15, uh, GE14, uh, we never had a shadow cabinet because theoretically every political party have their own shadow cabinet. 
uh, there is no united shadow cabinet of Pakatan. That was never the uh, the arrangement. Yeah. Mm, okay. Thank you, uh, YB Wong Chen. Um, I just would like to follow up a bit on this issue of state-federal uh, relations. Um, so I remember that uh, when uh, one of the one of the early meetings, I think that the Prime Minister called uh, to talk about to discuss this crisis uh, with the state governments. Uh, it was revealed that uh, the state governments that were under the administration of the opposition, uh, the chief ministers were not um, invited to that meeting. And uh, I remember, uh, Trisha, uh, we, uh, you, we were having a conversation about this on, on WhatsApp and then you were saying that um, this is not a, a, a new practice actually, it's been going on um, uh, from before. So, um, and I think you touched upon this as well in the research work that you do with the paper that you've, papers that you've written. Um, would you like to just uh, comment on this and, um, and maybe just give an overview of how that became maybe the norm in, in Malaysia? Hi, thanks, Ira. Uh, yeah, I actually recently wrote an article about this, so um, you can share that with the, uh, with the attendees later. Um, essentially, the way that the government, the federal government has operated for all these years um, while under BN, uh, actually also under Pakatan, so maybe YB Wong Chen can respond to that, is that whenever the ruling coalition uh, had control of states uh, and when opposition controlled states were in the fray, the opposition controlled states, uh, so sorry, let me rephrase that. The federal government would always have a duplicate development office within states that were held by the opposition. And in uh, both cases, when BN was in government, and I believe also when Pakatan was in government, and I'm sure it is at the moment as well, development funds would always bypass the opposition government within the state, and it would go directly to what is called the Federal Development Office. So if you see the, the Chief Secretary's response, um, you know, he took the, the, the hit for it, right? He said that, oh, he invited in the opposition states, he invited um, the Federal Development Officer to attend that emergency meeting and not the Menteri Basars of those states. And I think that that was just procedural because um, the funds, the decision-making processes, uh, any kind of uh, you know, emergency measures would always take place without consulting the opposition states. And that has been um, the practice for all this time. Um, it is definitely a very undignified thing for the government to do, especially given that, as Wejet says, public health is, a, is, a, is on the concurrent list of the constitution. And in a time of crisis, um, this you know, is not something that uh, it was very becoming of, of the government of the day. And I really hope that if they have further emergency meetings to discuss uh, measures of COVID-19, they will include all of the state governments. And I think Prime Minister Muhyiddin has uh, responded by saying that he will, and we need to hold that um, to his word. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Trisha. Um, uh, we will definitely share your, uh, you, you wrote already one policy paper for ideas uh, in, on this topic and there is another one upcoming uh, which we will uh, launch uh, possibly later this month. So um, just a shout out to everyone uh, to look forward to that. Um, we have uh, 10 minutes more actually. So I think um, I would just like to, um, to pose uh, this, there's, there's this one question I think which is uh, very interesting for, for all the panelists to comment on before we, we end our webinar for today. So there's a question from an anonymous attendee here, which I will read out in, in its entirety. Um, it seems like we haven't really thought out what democracy should look like in times of crisis. Yes, there should be a balance between efficiency and democratic accountability principles and also other factors. Uh, moving forward, what should we be thinking about and what are the things that this crisis really demonstrates that we haven't really uh, thought about much uh, in, in so-called normal times, right? So uh, maybe we can start with uh, Wei Jie, uh, your thoughts on this question and uh, just as your closing remarks and then Trisha and then YB Wong Chen. Thank you. Well, I think that question ties into that earlier sentiment on 
why are we elitists sitting this in a webinar talking about transparency and accountability when people on the ground need food and aid to eat? Well, my question to those people who, who bring up the immediately within the next within few days or a more polished policy that has gone through constructive feedback that has gone through you know a lot of constructive criticism which may benefit you in the longer term so we have already seen some shortfalls in the current policies like yabi wang chen pointed out you know we need to provide smes a longer hope that it will last that their businesses will continue after the three-month period to prevent them from closing shop so perhaps the government could have given subsidies up to six months or could have targeted better subsidies to industries which are more harder hit such as F&B or the hotel or the aviation. So my point is we should, we should polish policies so that they are effective and they have longer term impacts which are better rather than giving you something that you need now. And other countries all over the globe have already tabled their budgets in parliament and they have gone through the requisite opposition debate. This is not unique. So that is the message that I want to, to send at the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, Patricia, your thoughts? Um, that's a really big picture question. Um, I think it definitely has caused us to pause and to rethink um, our priorities, not just for ourselves and our families, but for, for our countries and for societies at large. Um, I think that practitioners in this field, uh, people like us, you know, activists, think tankers, uh, public advocates for rights and so on. We have been, um, we have been on that trajectory of talking about democrat democratic accountability, um, sometimes at a cost of, of forgetting what is the, the actual felt need on the ground. So that is a failure for, for people like us, maybe uh, elitists like us. But I also don't want to be too pessimistic as to say that um, it's, it's all for no reason, because I think at the end of the day, the reason people like us do what we do is precisely because we want um, a shared common good to be most effectively and efficiently um, felt and, and the societies and the communities that we do this for, for them to to be the recipients and the beneficiaries of this, whatever this public common good is. And in this instance, I think one of the things that perhaps we did not think about was, um, was the, the security aspect. So the security aspect has definitely weighed upon our minds a lot more. And if you see how China dealt with the situation in a very authoritarian manner and managed to deal with the effects of COVID just within three months, and then now they've kind of gone, gone past the peak of it. Um, I think this is a discussion that will emerge after this. The discussion will be that, oh, look, authoritarian countries like China have been able to do it so well, um, whereas your Western liberal democracies like in Europe and in the US are not going to impose these measures and therefore they're not going to get out of the COVID um, trap so quickly. So that is the, the, I think that is the issue that we must contend with in the future. Uh, the, the very easy slippery slope into the pit of authoritarian measures that governments will take, or they have already taken, but the, the risk is that they will not let that go um, after the end of this, you know, whatever, six month, 12 month period. So that's what we need to think about. But I also want to end on a perhaps more positive mm -hmm. note. Um, I would like, if you can, uh, to read this really excellent piece by Yuval Noah Harari. Um, I think you can just search for it. It's, uh, it's on FT and it's called, uh, I just pulled it up. It's called The World After Coronavirus. And I really like it because it's quite a balanced view of, of all these things that we had just talked about. And I think at the end of it, humanity still has um, a, a positive role to play. And I think one of the things he says is that that governments and societies can get out of this rut by communicating and by sharing information and by being more open 
and not less open about the way they do things. And that's how we get past this. So that's um, quite a, a reflective piece there. But I think it's something that we need to think about, uh, especially those of us who believe in the values of democracy and public accountability. Um, I just want to repeat again that the reason we do this and the reason we call for that is precisely because we want the people in the communities, especially the vulnerable, to, to be the beneficiaries and to get what they, they should um, for the public common good. Thank you. Thanks, Trisha, uh, for, uh, for that profound, um, for those profound remarks and thanks for mentioning the article as well. Uh, YB Wong Chen, I think uh, apart from the, the quest, this question I posed earlier, um, there's another one actually from, uh, from Zaigen. Uh, if you go to the chat uh, window, which I think is quite good for you to answer, uh, which is um, with the data that different institutions are collecting in helping to gauge the efficacy of the stimulus funds used, uh, presumably this data will end up with the NSC. Does the parliament have the power to request the council for these numbers? Um, so. Uh, those two, your responses to those two questions. Okay, let me do a Zaigen's question. Uh, we, in Parliament, we have the ability to pose questions to ministers, but it will be, it will take months, yeah? Because say, if say we are, we are targeted for 18th of May, uh, and the sitting is about a month, we could get the answer on the 18th of June, yeah? So this kind of thing is, is generally, and they can give you lousy answers as well because you know that's just typical government government approach, whichever government. Yeah, you ask a direct question, they give you something else. You ask for A, you give you they give you Z or something. So I won't hold that to the ground as 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 to get a proper answer from them. But generally, I don't think they will share it because it could fall under the uh, Official Secrets Act if it's under some sort of uh, National Security Council issue. Okay, now to answer the question whether we need a new system to deal with crisis. We actually do have a system, it's called emergency laws. But this, I'm not advocating emergency laws, by the way, but this is not a scenario where emergency uh, laws should be implemented, where they can rule by, by decree. Yeah? Uh, I think this one, the current system is adequate enough. It needs, again, tinkering in terms of budget for parliament. Parliament needs to be independently funded, not by the Prime Minister's office. It needs to have officers that report to the Speaker, not to the Prime Minister. And we need more select committees. So just, just tinkering the things that we should have done when we were in Pakatan Harapan, just getting it right. Now, on that front, we were very close to getting a Parliamentary Services Act to give Parliament independence, and then we lost government. So that's the, that's the sad, sad aspect of the whole thing. Now, uh, lastly, I, I agree with Tricia, and, and I state this uh, you know, over and over again. After every crisis, generally the world becomes better. After World War I, it became better. After World War II, it became better. After we go through this kind of crisis, it becomes better. Yeah? So I, I do think that we need, have, we need to look at the overall system, the, our economic system, whether it can sustain itself in this kind of high inequality status. Uh, and we have to look into uh, many ways about you know, how people work, how interact, uh, until we find a vaccine a year down the line, or until we find a, a cure you know, in the next six months or so. I think there's a lot of time for us to rethink how we live and interact. And that's the key point. People are resilient, communities are resilient, and people are generally 90% good, and that you know, we, we need to, to take that opportunity, being stuck at home, read a lot more, think about the future we want, and I'm sure we'll get through this. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, YB. Thank you, Wei Jiet, and thank you, Trisha, for very insightful uh, comments and contributions, suggestions for our webinar today. So before we end, I would just like to inform everyone, all the attendees, and also to the panelists that we are having another webinar tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, f uh, at 11 a.m. as well, same time. So tomorrow's topic is uh, COVID-19 stimulus package, supporting SMEs with an exit strategy. Uh, the panelists will be YB Dr. Ong Kian Ming, uh, MP for Bangi, Datuk Michael Kang, who's the National President of the SME Association of Malaysia, 
Uh, we have Dato Eng Wan Peng, who's the CEO of MDEC and will be moderated by uh, Lau, who is our uh, Economics and Business Unit Manager. So, uh, do tune in. There are some places left, I think, for registration, so do register. Uh, in any case, we will be uploading the recording uh, on our social media as usual. So thank you very much for tuning in to the third webinar in our COVID-19 series. Uh, thanks again to the panelists and for all the attendees. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy and uh, stay home. So uh, take care everyone.